closest then to family in scripture is education. So the authority that God has given for children is in the parents. When the children grow up, they are an authority over themselves. And if you don't know that, you probably never had children or worked with children. And, and so the authority of the parents over the child has a limitation. The child should always seek the wisdom. But the choice is theirs. And the parents cannot take more authority over us than God does. So literally, if you're not raising your children to be independent and make good choices, they'll have to learn that on their own, which is, uh, which is tragic, because they, they will become independent, and they will make their own choices, and they won't be prepared for that. But God's design is not dependence, but interdependence. So otherwise, we're, we, don't, we don't need each other, we want each other. You with me? God doesn't need us. He wants us. The, 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 the true essence of love is not need. The essence of love is I, I want to be a part of your life. I want you to be a part of my life. So, so in God's design, the wisdom of the elders, the wisdom of the parents would, would always be something you would want. But the individual would understand that they still are responsible before God to make their own choice. And, and God won't say, well, what did so-and-so tell you to do? God will say, what did I tell you to do and what did you choose to do? So we, we learn love in the family, whether we like it or not. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's just uh, amazing how strong this is because the definition of love is learned in the family and it's not learned verbally, it's learned by absorption and by association. Even though we think we are not going to be like our parents, when we get married <laughs> and raise children, when we get married and have children, lo and behold, our parents reappear. <laughs> and so, you know, there's that joke that when you go to bed on your wedding night, there are six people in the bed. You and your spouse, their parents, and your parents. And we only have one model we've grown up with, although in modern society we have two or three. They're still formational. Of what it looks like to live together and, and to love each other. So we may have a verbal definition of love, but when we enter into a relationship, we act out and remodel what we've seen. And so those uh, who abuse their wives have almost always watched their fathers abuse their wives. It's just, you know, it's mathematical. It's not 100%, but it's, it's overwhelming. You swear you'll never yell at each other, and then, you know, your screaming parents come out in a moment. You swear you'll never discipline your children this way. You will always. And so love is intended to be encoded at a very early stage. And one of our greatest struggles uh, in working out our own salvation is to work out the definition of love we've had modeled and to receive from God a new definition. And that's why it takes us so long to understand what God means when he says, I love you. You know, so we will embrace almost everything about God cognitively. But when we turn around, the one thing we'll question is, does he really love me? How could he? How could I be lovable? And we've got, we have a lifetime of recordings that are, that are not teachings that you can reevaluate. They're, they define reality. They're what you absorbed before you were thinking about it. Okay, so, so you can either look at marriage as the, the crucible, or the deliverer 
<laughs> well, actually, it's probably both. But God's intent is through marriage and the intimacy of that and the fact that we do become revealed even to ourselves for who we actually are, good and bad, to deliver us from what's been built into us and change us more into his likeness. So, so it's tough going, but it's purposeful. And of course, for those who are like me, who have been single all their life, although I'm only 66, I have one friend that married first time at 70, so, you know, I'm available. <laughs> um, yeah, but they, uh, they need to have more assets than I do. <laughs> That's probably my criterion, not God's. Uh, if, if you don't marry, God has many other ways of breaking that and of course in my life I have been in a volunteer organization where we live together, eat together, breathe together, work together 24-7 and I tell you you learn who you really are <laughs> and what you want to be and you know so there are other ways for God to work that out but it is part of the purpose of marriage is to help us to become more like Christ and to raise a generation that begin with a better palate to work with. Okay, so the authority of education then is the parents. So in education, God reveals the great teacher. And... Uh, That what he models is that we can all learn. Our education systems don't build on that philosophy. Our education system says, here's how we teach. You need to learn this way. God says, here's who you are. I'll work with you. Isn't that wonderful? And so he is the great teacher. He is the one that knows how we're made, knows how we learn, knows what we need. And if we will follow him, even though sometimes the path looks a little strange, he will bring us into our maturity and our fullness. Uh, the attribute that God is revealing is, is his love of knowledge. So we have this debate going on in, 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 in modern society, I think it's been around for at least two generations now, about, you know, is it wisdom or is it data? Is it, is it knowing about things or how to do things? And education kind of picks one or the other. And if you like science fiction, which I do, that's the whole point of Spock who is all data, and later in the Star Trek series, his character, the new character, is data. He knows everything. But he has no human element of intuition or implication. <laughs> and so the, that's, uh, the, the doctor, oddly enough, is the one that's all emotional and intuitive. And then, of course, the captain of the starship is the one that keeps trying to pick and choose what he needs, wisdom or understanding, wisdom or understanding, data or, or wisdom. Okay, so here's, here's the new flash from, from the kingdom of God. God doesn't choose. He likes both. He has all data. So if you hate the internet, I'm, I'm sorry, God has even more. <laughs> there is nothing wrong with information. You cannot possibly have too much information. You can just not know how to use it. And the, what makes God God is he has all data and the wisdom to know what to do with it. Wow. Whoa. In computers, a couple of decades ago, we used to call that a no-bot. A no-bot was a program that would go in and find the information you actually needed and tell you how to use it instead of you going through everything you don't need. God is the ultimate nobot. Okay, so, so God wants us to learn about the world we live in. And, and it's amazing in education because 
universities started because of a biblical view of God and man. And because it was assumed that God was over all things, and therefore the study of all things was essential for the maturing of, of an individual, you had colleges, you, and, and you had programs where you studied some science, you studied some literature, you studied some history. It was a liberal arts program, we call it in the States. There was no school of theology, because it was all theology. See how much we've changed? Split thinking says, no, I go here to learn how to do business, and then maybe I should go to Bible school too, so I learn about God. My graduates from my college will say to me, and these are people that have spent four years, they say, I just can't figure out how to get God into my daily work. And I think, how did you get him out? Mm -hmm. What is the thinking that says, He's not engaged in that. Well, it's, it's just this wall that's been built in our understanding. It's very, very, very difficult to break down because the whole world thinks like this. That's why we have so much trouble using words like secular and sacred, and what does that really mean? And, you know, in government now we're tossing this around as, as though we know what those terms mean, and we don't know how to articulate the problem because we've lost the language, because we've lost the concept. So, so theology is literally the study of everything. <laughs> and what we have a tendency to produce today in education are specialists who can't, war who can't live outside of their specialization. They know nothing about life except how this works. Okay, so... So literally, science, as we understand it today, and uh, degrees and study as, as universities came into existence came out of a biblical understanding of who God is and what he wants us to know. And, and we've lost that. We've lost authority in that. We don't even, th we, we, you know, our view is, you know, you go to the school and lose your faith. Well, why would you go to school to get a faith? the responsibility for learning your value systems in the home. If you go to school and learn your value system, it's because there wasn't anything at home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we blame education. If you study parenting of children, you will walk away from scripture uh, a little bit impressed with what God has to say about the need to obey your parents and overwhelmingly devastated by what God says about the responsibility of the parents to parent their children. Values teaching does not belong to the church. It does not belong to the government. It doesn't belong to the education system. The only place it can be done is in the home and it has to be modeled, not talked about. And if it is not done there, then the child is like a boat on the sea. And as they go off, they just try to latch on to something that stabilizes their life. But it is not because that system is failing to protect the child. It's because the home has failed to prepare the child to enter in the world and have a sense of self and a sense of values. This is so powerful that when the Soviet Union, Soviet Union, uh, communism was in control of everything. The government controlled everything. That's the basic philosophy. It controlled the education. They controlled the media. They controlled what school you went to, what job you got. They controlled all books that were published or weren't published, every movie that came in, all the TV, all the radio. There wasn't anything that wasn't utilized for communist propaganda. So literally 24-7, if you were engaged with the media or outside your own home, the message was communism is great. This is who we are and what we believe. When the, when the Iron Curtain fell, <laughs> less than 70% of the population of the former Soviet Union were communists. <laughs> Well, how could that happen? I mean, today we're so convinced that if the TV says it, everybody will believe it. Mm 
If the school says it, everybody will believe it. And I hear Christians talk like this. And yet in the Soviet Union for 70 years, they had, they had all the money in the country, and the message was consistent everywhere. So where did this child get the idea he wasn't a communist? From his parents. <laughs> so where is this great well of influence in the home? And you say, well, I, you know, I wasn't able to influence my child. Oh, yes, you did. Because you can't not. You just don't like the influence you had. Because it's not enough to say, do this, don't do this. You have to do it. So the Bible says, as you walk along the road, as you go to your business, and fathers, it's you God speaks to most often, not the mother. And yet in our culture, we say, no, the mother's primarily responsible for the values and the rearing of the child, and the father earns the income. No, God says it's the other way around. Amen. And how do you do it? By sitting down and having a Bible study every Thursday morning? No, by taking them with you. And what is the first thing a two- and three-year-old learns? Go! Go! And it doesn't matter where you're going, a small child wants to go with you. And would prefer to do that than watch television any day of the week. <laughs> it's encoded into the child to want to absorb that from the parent. And so you take the child along, you're going blankety, blankety, blank, 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 blank. Now remember to love Jesus. <laughs> It doesn't work that way. Okay, so, so education then reveals the great teacher. And the authority is from the parents. So what am I saying? Parents have to educate their children? No. The system of education uh, can be quite diverse. So in scripture, you have religious schools, you have government schools, you have private schools, you have homeschooling, you have mentoring. You know, that's an application, okay? The, the principles are, number one, every child has the right to be educated. And this concept of the right to education came from Calvin. There was no public education when Calvin went to Geneva had 5,000 French refugees gathered there. It wasn't even a city. And, and conceived, because of his saturation with scripture, that education was not of and for the elite, but for all of God's valuable human beings, all children, regardless of what their faith, creed, or economic status had a right to learn about God. And education was learning about God and all that he's made. And so public education was conceived right there with a refugee population from, a, from, a, from a, a Christian Bible scholar with a sense of changing society. <laughs> well, it spread through the whole world. Almost every country in the world has some level, but God's desire is for every child to reach their highest level of potential. Okay, so we got a ways to go. But imagine if one man with 5,000 refugees could sow a seed that led to universal public education at some level. Imagine what we could do today with the Internet. So that any child who wanted an education could get it. And they are actually already doing this. In India, the very first thing parents get for their children is a computer because it opens up the whole world of international education for them. They may not own anything else, but they've got a computer, and they've figured out a way to get on the Internet. Okay, so, so every child has a right to education. Well, the first question society will ask is how we're going to pay for it. Well, God says that you have to figure that out. I don't actually care. As long as you achieve the goal. <laughs> But the objective, we have failed as a nation if we fail to do our best to make sure every child 
has that opportunity. Now, some children will not want to use it, and some children will not have the capacity to go to the highest levels. And we don't need everybody to go to the highest levels. But, but, the, but the value is they're made in the image of God, and they have the right to develop that, those abilities to their highest level in the service of the community. Now, will they use it to serve the community? We don't know. That's a choice. We're not in control. But if we give them something to work with, okay? But when children are small, before the age of accountability, and the age of accountability is a biblical concept, and in Israel it was the bar mitzvah, 13. We would all think that is a little too young. But the age of accountability in in scripture is the point at which you are no longer a child and are now responsible for your own actions. So at your bar mitzvah, before your bar mitzvah in scripture, if you did something illegal, your parents were responsible. Wow. If you, if you did something that, that that uh, caused a financial loss of, for someone. Your parents were responsible. After the bar mitzvah, you're responsible. So literally, age of accountability is a legal definition. There is no perfect age. This was before parliament in South Africa, and I was meeting with some of the parliamentarians, and they're going, oh, they want this age, they want this age, and they want this age. And I said, well, you know, there is no perfect age. I said, actually, as biblical thinkers, you don't care what the age is as long as we pick it and draw the line. <laughs> because the fact is, you have mature 10-year-olds and then mature 50-year-olds. It's not intended to be a line that now we get there and we're mature, although we should work really hard to help our children be mature by the line. And maturity is not dependent. Okay, so, but what you care about is that before they get to that line, the parents are responsible. That's what God is saying. The parents are responsible. This was in your, in your capacity to make difference. And after that, no matter what happened before that, the individual is responsible. Because, because crime and consequences is not about the influences that may have brought you to that place to do it. Crime, the, the awfulness of crime is that you have hurt the community and you can't unhurt them. And the consequences are because the community has the right to be protected, not because you deserve this. I said something very, very, very radical just then. Because that isn't our system of justice at all. See, so God is not going, okay, you know, you murdered so-and-so, you're a terrible person now. You know, God is going, I know there are factors, but you murdered a person. And we can't erase the value. I'll forgive you. But we can't erase reality. The choice is made. The deed is done. The consequences are there. And, and our, our, our legal consequences should be commensurate with the crime. And God gives us quite a latitude of choices. But when we devalue the crime, we're devaluing the consequences. Meaning, the impact it has on the community. Okay, so... So God says that for small children, before the age of accountability, the authority over them is their parents. So the best school systems are those school systems that, that either because of the culture or because of the system get the parents engaged. So in education, we know that if the parents are paying attention to what the child's doing when they come home from school, are you doing your homework? Have you done this? If the parents are engaging with the teachers, how are they doing this? How are they doing that? The child would do better. That's why the Japanese and the, the Chinese are just beating the pants off of us. 
Why? Because they know what their children's doing 24-7. And when their grades start going down, they hire a tutor, even if they're poor people. They do everything they can to hire that tutor. They are, it is not acceptable for you to fail, the parent is saying. And the child really believes that when the parent says it. When the teacher says it, so when you remove any parental authority from the public school system, I know you use that word differently, but from the school system, it doesn't have any authority. So you know in the United States there's this big thing about we outlawed prayer and we uh, and it in our schools and so our schools were destroyed. Well, I don't think it's good to outlaw prayer. I think it's a silly law, but but you can't outlaw prayer. <laughs> You know, that's not possible. Because you don't have to meet to pray and you don't have to pray out loud. See, so I'm not sure it's outlawing prayer that destroyed our schools, but I'm sure it was a, it was a bad law. But what destroyed America's school system? Well, at the same time, some years before, we moved the authority for the American public school system from parent-teacher organizations to the national government, National Education Association. Oh, that's a fundamental flaw. That's a fundamental flaw. And anyone who is taught over a period of time, which I began as, as, as a teacher, and so I know schools before and I know schools after, knows that crime and disrespect and not attending school and in the public school system began to go down like this. Were the teachers worse? No. Were the students no rebe more rebellious? No. Was the curriculum worse? No. What happened? School no longer had any authority in the child's life. Why? Because the parent wasn't participating. Hmm. Okay. Well, how do we want to get that back? Well, you know, doing these things at a national level is a, it, it takes time. It takes a generation, two generations to change. But we know where we want to get to. And meanwhile, who cares what the public school system or the private school system does? Be engaged in your children's education. You know, I was dyslectic. They said I'd never finish high school. But my mother said from day one, I would graduate from college. I said, I will never go to college in high school. You know, they said, she'll never get in. But my mother said, you will go to college. And by golly, <laughs> it was just unacceptable. Now, does that mean any mother who believes in her child, they can do what she believes they can do? No, but it's a powerful influence when parents say, you can do this, and I'm paying attention. Dads are the key to their children's identities. When you raise a child, giving them a mold to fit, you create in them rejection of self. And culture does nothing better than to give boys and girls a mold to fit. And dads are slightly more obsessed with this than mothers. I don't know why, but it's true. Like a man. Only boys do that. Stop doing that. And I changed my tone of voice because we have a tendency to do that with our boys and girls. <laughs> uh, okay, see, the, 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 the question in parenting is not what do I want my child to be, but what has God made my child and how can I nurture that into its fullness? See, who cares if the, if the little boy hates rugby? Who cares if the girl loves it? <laughs> you know, we, we have different interests. Who cares if he's good at mathematics? 
you know, or he loves the piano. Who cares if she's, she loves engineering? She loves it because that's the way God made her. It has nothing to do with defining her. It's not wrong to be mathematical or to love music and to hate being hurt or not care or to have no fear. These are, these are, these are not right or wrong things. These are part of the sophisticated makeup of an individual. And so it is, it, is, it is fathers, God says, nurture what your child is, affirm that. But you know what has to happen so often? Somehow fathers feel like their identity is in how the child turns out. Oh. Passing it on generation to generation to generation. Self-loathing from one generation to another. I didn't get to be what I wanted. I wasn't accepted for what I wanted. Now you have to fit the box too. We can break these cycles, but they're not broken in school. We can have great schools, but they will not substitute for, for parental involvement. There is nothing in research of education that shows what the child learns has anything to do with how much time they spent in the classroom or how much money was spent on the school system. Tony Blair learned that with his, with his academy. <clears throat> what, what research shows globally is what the child learns depends on the parental expectations and involvement in the process and how the subject is taught.